seeing. Um, phosphorus levels are coming off of those fields and actually making it to the lake. Um, she's got tremendous lines of funding. She's received some money from Ohio Sea Grant, but she's also got close to a million dollars from the Soybean Council to do some of the critically important work that she's going to present, or some of the work that she does, not the work that specifically she's going to present today. Um, what we typically do when we introduce our speakers before we, we like her to get into the fantastic science she's doing, we ask her to kind of talk to um, the audience here about how she got to where she is, um, specifically for, especially for the students that are in the audience, to see, you know, where they're at in their education and how you might go from where you are now to, you know, when you enter your professional career. So Dr. Dayton's agreed to give us a little glimpse into her path to where she is now today, and then she'll roll into her, um, to her talk. Everybody can welcome Dr. Dayton. <laughs> two seconds ago that they want my sad story of how I got where I am. And I thought, man, if I had to reveal my checkered past, I don't know if I would have come up. So I have a checkered past, and uh, for what it's worth, it may be helpful to the students. I was a mediocre student. I went to college right out of high school, which was a fairly unmitigated disaster, so of course I married young. And uh, so that was an unmitigated disaster. So I moved to Martha's Vineyard and I was selling real estate. And after doing that for about four years, right after the real estate market crashed in the late 80s, I just thought, oh, what are you doing? So I'd always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to be a scientist, but I never thought I was smart enough. But by then I was older, I was more confident, I was more bitter. And so I went back and I actually retook my SATs and I went back to school. And at the time I had this vague notion that I wanted to be a botanist. But I wanted to grow plants for, to do something to help the environment, but I was totally this vague notion. So luckily I got some good advisors at the University of Massachusetts who said, well, you should be an environmental science. So I said, all right. So I went into environmental science, and I always intended to get a PhD, because I figured, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound at this point. And um, I had no idea what I wanted to do a PhD in, but you learn when you're in environmental science, or at least I did, it seemed to me, if you're doing environmental science, you're going to do water, soil, or air. And I chose soil. So I got a master's and a PhD in soil science, but always with that environmental, we work with contaminated soils, we work with agronomic contaminants, beneficial reuse of byproducts, and that's what gets me excited. So I've enjoyed hearing all you all's research projects today. And man, we're going to shift some gears here because I do something very different. And so it'll be interesting to see if, 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 if I cover all the things that, that you were just coached to do. So shifting gears from the lake back onto the soil, today we're going to talk about beneficial use of Toledo Harbor dredge material in manufactured soil blending. So as I say, um, I'm a soil scientist. We're in the Soil Environmental Chemistry Group at Ohio State, and we do a lot of work with beneficial reuse of different municipal and industrial byproducts for land application and as soil substitutes, manufactured soil blending. Um, I think Chris mentioned I do a lot of work with non-point source agricultural pollution. Um, we do biogeochemical cycling trace of trace elements. We work with a lot of contaminated soils, uh, military bases, super fun, brownfield, and uh, we do use do human and ecological toxicology as a, for, for contaminated soils. So this is traditional soil science. A lot of agriculture, fertility. We do a lot of uh, simulated rainfall runoff studies for pesticides and nutrients. Um, but the beneficial reuse of industry and industrial and municipal byproducts is what I was asked to talk about today, specifically Toledo Harbor dredge material. So a lot of people think, well, geez, isn't that stuff all contaminated? It's a horrible stuff. Why would you want to do anything with it? Well, depending on what the material is, there's a lot of benefits in some of these. Some of these materials can be used as a fertilizer source. A lot of materials can be used as a lime substitute, a lot of spent lime from the drinking water treatment process. Um, of course, biosolids, a good fertilizer source. 
Uh, Non-point source agriculture pollution sorbent. We find high iron or aluminum oxide bearing byproducts from other industrial products. And they actually do a tremendous job of binding non-point source agricultural phosphorus. So we do a lot of work with that. As a matter of fact, I'm just starting a project doing that. Uh, remediation of contaminated sites. Again, you know, if we can raise the pH, if we can um, apply, uh, again, these oxides also bind contaminants. They bind phosphate, they also bind arsenic. So we can reduce the toxicity in a contaminated situation. Uh, so, and then, of course, manufacture of soil blending, restoration of disturbed sites, the landscape industry, construction sites, all need topsoil. So you always need raw materials for topsoil blends. So we think this is kind of novel. So what we've been working on is how do we characterize different components um, to see how they will behave in a manufactured soil blend so that we can tailor a blend to an end use. So some of the things we've worked with are uh, spent foundry sand, got our Toledo Harbor dredge material, biosolids, good, good source of organic matter and nutrients, and then we've got this high clay alumina, which is actually a byproduct of making um, aluminum sulfate, making um, alum for drinking water treatment. So key considerations when we're tailoring a soil blend is uh, what's the end use? Um, obviously, they're all going to be some sort of a, a plant growing medium, but is it a potting mix? Is it for turf? Is it for landscape? And then um, we come up with a characterization scheme um, that will decide what, how to blend it in order to meet those end uses. So of course, we always look at all the environmental, any potential for an environmental issue with any industrial municipal byproduct. We also look at the nutrient status. And then, of course, ultimately, we look at the physical properties of the finished blend. So today, we're gonna, I'm going to give some, an example, and, but we're using a Toledo Harbor dredge material as uh, the primary uh, component. And uh, this is a result of a sea grant. <laughs> so, uh, so what I wanted to show today is just an example of some of the blending that we've been doing and, and how that's all going. Uh, so this is a preliminary evaluation we did with the, the Toledo Harbor dredge material. Um, and this was a little project we did for the city of Toledo. Uh, the city of Toledo um, is working with the land bank there, and they're going to be demolishing up to 500 houses per year for the next three years. So all that property, they take the house out, they've got to fill the basement and remediate the yard and plant grass. So they're figuring it's going to take about approximately 200 cubic yards of soil per lot on average to remediate those, those properties. So that's going to consume about 300,000 cubic yards of topsoil. And frankly, they don't have, they don't have that much topsoil. So we, were, we had a meeting with them, and so we asked them with, uh, with Joe Caffel from the Toledo Port Authority, and we said, well, would you be interested in using dredge material? And they're like, yeah. So they asked us to come up with a, a recipe. So what we did was we characterized, so the objective of the project was to characterize the Toledo dredge material and evaluate potential soil blends. Uh, what they asked us for, because they also run a municipal leaf compost facility, which was causing them a tremendous amount of headaches as well. So they said, well, if you can use a leaf compost, that'd be great. So we said, all right, so we'll try to focus um, just on uh, the dredge material and compost, but we also, because I, I, can't, I can't resist it, I had a little spent foundry sand in also. So we tested 100% uh, dredge, and then 80% dredge, 20% compost, and then 70, 20, and then we added 10% of the spent foundry sand to see how the performance would go. So again, always start, we start with a total digest of each of the component materials to make sure that there are no contaminants, nothing sneaking in that we weren't aware of. So we evaluate each of the components individually. Um, and then we also compare them to whatever regulatory, um, uh, whatever's going to be the regulatory list, whatever's going to be controlling it, for, because this is going to be residential use. Um, to make sure that everything is okay. 
We look at the plan available nutrients, because one thing the city of Toledo asked for was a low nutrient blend, because it cost them a fortune to be out cutting grass all the time. So, so they didn't want to add any biosolids or any manure. They just wanted a low nutrient blend. So we look at the main, all the macro and micro plant nutrients. We look at organic matter, organic carbon. Uh, we use a dry combustion method, but then for organic carbon, we use a dichromate reduction. And then we also look at other physical properties of the blended material. Obviously, we look at pH and salinity, again, to make sure that we're going to be within a range that for, for good plant growth. But then we look at bulk density and porosity, because that's so important for root development. Water holding capacity and plant available water, uh, two sides of the same coin. But we're finding that those are really driving the final blend quality very, more and more we're finding that that's what it comes down to. So we wanted to get keep our pH between 5 and 8.5, although, frankly, we keep it even narrower than that. Salinity, we just don't want any. Bulk density, a typical mineral soil will have a bulk density between 1.2 and 1.4 gram per cubic centimeter. Um, that's probably okay for a landscape soil. You like something a little fluffier, a little lighter, and you know, in a potting mix, uh, you're going to be less than one uh, gram per cubic centimeter. Um, and of course, that has a lot to do, I don't know if you can see that very well, but at a low bulk density, you do get a better root penetration, you get better root health, greater porosity than if your soil is high in high bulk density, heavy, dense, and sodden. Uh, organic matter, um, again, in a typical, uh, what would be considered a high soil organic matter soil, soil organic carbon would be like between 2 and 4 percent. Um, a muck soil is greater than 10 percent. So we want to, you know, we like to be in this range, um, and we have a lot of compost to get there. Again, this, is, this controls nutrient retention, water holding capacity, aeration, porosity, and it reduces bulk density. So we can control a lot of these things by how much compost and organic matter we blend in. Um, a range in water holding capacity, so again, Typical soils. A sandy soil will really only be able to retain, and this is a gram for gram, gram of water per gram of soil, 10% of, you know, something that's a little siltier like you find in this area, uh, can have a water holding capacity of about 25%. But then, of course, you're getting a heavy, wet clay, they can retain a lot more. So again, the, the water holding capacity doesn't necessarily tell you what the plain available water is. But it does tell us something about our blend, and it helps us establish the blend ratios. So plant available water is actually uh, the water holding capacity minus the permanent wilting point for a plant. And so with the permanent wilting point, we actually are doing it with, uh, we grow sunflowers, and we wilt them, and we torch them. <laughs> and they're like an indicator plant. So the water content, when we kill the sunflower, is the permanent wilting point. And so the difference between the water holding capacity of the soil and the, and the water content at the permanent wilting point gives us a measure of the plant available water. And we're, we're learning that this is oddly important and not as obvious as you'd think, um, because this is ultimately what controls how much water that soil is going to make available to the plant. And uh, the soil blenders have, have really, we work with commercial soil blenders, and they've really impressed upon us that it's really important for them to understand this. So we've been focusing a lot of attention on it. So uh, some of the results, um, this is the total elemental content of the dredge. And I would say there were no, nothing was elevated particularly. As a matter of fact, I would say it was kind of low generally. No surprises. We we're all very happy with it. Um, again, we characterize each of the blends individually because by understanding what each blend, the characteristics of each blend, it helps us establish the test blend ratios that we're going to use when we start mixing. Um, so we had a clay loam texture for the for the dredge uh, straight up. 
compost really doesn't have a texture, and of course the sand has a sand texture. Uh, organic carbon in the in the dredge wasn't bad at two, a little better than two percent, and of course the compost was very high, no salinity problems, reasonable pH, a little high but reasonable for around here, adequate, adequate, huge, but good, low for uh, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and plant available nitrogen in the dredge. So the nutrients, for the most part, were kind of on either adequate or a little low. Um, much higher, of course, in the compost, much higher than, is, than you would need to grow a plant. So that's going to be a little bit enriching. And then, of course, the sand had very low, high, high, low for potassium, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and plant available nitrogen. So again, we characterize each of the materials individually because that guides us to the test blend, how, what ratios we're going to blend at. So, uh, so these are the test, these are the initial test blends that we did for the city of Toledo. Again, um, we did the, the 100%, uh, the 80-20 with just the compost, 70-20-10 with the dredge, compost, and the sand, and each one we grew, one we just uh, incubated, and the other one we did, we grew grass in, because we were kind of wanted to see if growing grass would have a significant difference in water infiltration or water holding capacity for the development of soil structure. So um, the bulk density of the Toledo Arbor dredge all along, being a, what was I say, it was a clay loam. <laughs> was right around that 1.4. So I wouldn't say that's bad, but you're on the heavy side. It's definitely a mineral soil. By adding even just 20% compost, we brought that down, and then putting a little, well, the sand didn't really have much effect. So now we've got, um, this material is in a bulk density of 1.25, which is really good. Taste that. This is the uh, uh, saturated hydraulic conductivity. This tells you how much water can flow into the soil. And in the cities, this is really important because they have such a big problem with stormwater management, stormwater runoff, stormwater is all we hear about. So you want a soil that's going to be able to suck water in. When it rains, you want the water moving into the soil. You don't want it ponding and you don't want it running off. So the saturated hydraulic conductivity is another, another uh, component that we wanted to look at pretty carefully with our blends. So again, being a heavy, heavy-ish mineral soil at 100%, the hydraulics is centimeters of water per hour. So the dredge material alone really does not move a lot of water. So you could expect some runoff. You may be able to have some erosion because that water is just going to be a problem. But then you just add 20% 20, 20 compost and the uh, hydraulic conductivity goes up substantially. As a matter of fact, this is good. This is really fast. That's moving a lot of water. So we've increased our infiltration, and I think that's going to help a lot with your plants, because now you get your water actually into your soil rather than running down the street. Um, again, it wasn't a huge difference by adding that little bit of uh, sand. did not make a huge difference. Uh, pH didn't make a big difference. That was all stays fairly neutral. Um, water holding capacity, which is another one of those, again, that's really important for plants, was um, ex what you would expect exactly in the range for a mineral soil, but then it did improve with the addition of a, even a small amount of compost, 20% by volume. Um, so, so actually, back to so what we so what we recommended to the city was this blend: the 80 percent dredge, twenty percent compost. And uh, the last we heard, they were going to the land bank approved it, and they were going to be using it. Now we've had a change of personnel in the city, so I understand I need to make another trip up and I need to explain all this to them again. But I believe they are going to go forward with this, and I think it'll be a good good source of soil for them. So from there, we've expanded our trials, and this is something that's actually going on right now. Um, 
So what we were looking for here is we wanted to see, we really wanted to kind of take a closer look at text, soil texture. Again, by understanding all of our components individually, we can establish our blend ratios in order to target a textural class. So I don't know if all of you know about soil science and the textural classes, but mineral soils are composed of sand, silt, and clay-sized particles. And so the, the ratio of these particles determines its textural class. So this got cut off, but sand, um, the percent sand well, should be on this axis, and it increases in this direction, and then clay-sized particles in this direction, and then silt-sized particles in this direction. So the textural class would be uh, what's the combination of these sized particles, and that tells you a lot about the soil structure. It tells you a lot about its water holding capacity, its plant available water. It tells you a lot about how that soil is going to behave. So we wanted to say, well, we're really interested in water, so how much will texture affect that? So we made our ratios to target uh, right across, we just marched right across the textural triangle. So we start with our 100% dredge and our clay loam texture, and then we add, um, by adding some compost, and technically compost really should not affect texture because compost is organic and the texture is done from the mineral fraction. But honestly, there was a lot of dirt in our compost. This was a commercial product. Honestly, it looked terrible. It looked like ground up sticks. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but we take it as it comes, because that's the way it is in the real landscape world. So by adding a substantial amount of, of compost, we actually did change our texture, moved a little bit to, the, to a silty clay loam. Um, again, our 80-20 was back to the clay loam. But then we start bringing in sand, and then we start marching this way. So now we're into the loams, and then we moved all the way to what sandy loam by adding additional sand. We used a Scott product, a bag of Scott that we got at the nursery as a kind of a control soil, although it's so organic, I'm not sure that it's comparable. Um, we had uh, dredge material from two different collections, so they were slightly different materials. And each, each of these treatments we did with and without fertilizer to see if we have a big fertilizer effect. So lots of pots, and that doesn't show up very well. But at week one, we had a little bit of sprouting, nothing, you know. And then at week three, we have a lot of sprouting. Um, and they looked generally pretty darn good. At this period, we did not see a big fertilizer effect, which was surprising to me. And you see a couple of laggers here. And eh, well, maybe you can't see it that well, but you know, they were kind of not doing as well. Well, that was my 80-20 blend. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> so speak about things that don't cook all the way you think they should. So I was like, oh, man. So I was getting a little disgusted. Um, some of these others that were, that were growing like gangbusters, had a lot of spent foundry sand in them. They were like the 60% foundry sand. And I'm like, it's sand. How can this be doing so well? But I think, you know, when you when you watch them, I mean, I'm such a nerd. I stand there and watch them like a nerd while we, we use overhead, we use a simulated rainfall machine to water them. And you can actually watch, like, who's ponding water, who's infiltrating water. And you see how they're, and so you're like, oh, man. And the, the, so the better infiltration had better germination initially. Okay, now, and I don't have it now, because now we're into week four, we're gonna harvest next week. The ones in the high sand, they're starting to languish. They're already yellowing, and they're already showing stress, because it's sand. So, while they got a really good germination, now they're not so happy, because even with the fertilizer, they're hungry. And the Toledo Harbor Dredge 8020 blend is caught up. And now it looks really good, and it's really good color. Now we'll be measuring yield, um, so we'll harvest the grass, wash it, dry it, weigh it, then we grind it up, we digest it, and so within the tissue we can measure all the macro and micronutrients. And that's really where we start to see, did we have a fertilizer effect, and how well did each of, the, each of these blends really perform. Then on the pots, we'll be doing all the physical characterization, saturated hydraulic conductivity, 
bulk density, porosity, plain available water, and water holding capacity at the end of the trial to see how it did compared to the beginning of the trial. So we'll be doing that next week. So as we said to all of these students, why do we care? Why am I driving myself crazy over dirt? Well, we care because if, if we could promote the beneficial reuse of Toledo dredge material to the soil blending to all the landscapers in the Toledo area, the Cleveland area, up along the lakes, I think it could be a viable alternative to the open lake disposal of the dredge material. And right now, out of Toledo Harbor, what's it, close to a million cubic yards per year of dredge is dredged, is put on the barges, they take it out of the lake, and they dump it. So we're trying to find an alternative use. I also, just being a fan of beneficial reuse, I would always rather see um, a reuse option rather than a disposal option of anything that's a potential resource. However, we're, we've come to realize that soil blending alone could not begin to consume all of the material that Toledo Harbor needs to dredge. So as a preview of coming attractions, we've also been working actively with a group to consider an upland application of dredge material. So, I mean, we'd actually start putting it out onto farm fields. So I won't belabor all of this, but I would like to acknowledge that these slides came from Sam and Salaka, who works at Arcadis Engineering. And their company has a lot of experience with these large-scale dredge projects and moving large amounts of material. So, of course, we're, uh, we're looking, the problems with open lake disposal, of course, are turbidity, uh, releasing of nutrients, um, as you, uh, and then disruption of uh, fish spawning, which you all know way more about than I do. Um, so, and this also may be exacerbating the dead zones. So, what we're looking at is expanding the beneficial use options um, to eliminate the in-lake disposal of the dredge. So in order to be sustainable, and this again is from Sam, he's talking about you've got to be able to move all of the material. It has to go on the dredging time schedule, not on our time schedule. So what we're looking for is large tracts of land that would be available to take the material when it was needed. Um, it has to, and then by utilizing long-term low energy natural processes, it can, uh, it can actually help because the biggest problem with the dredge material is the water. So let me show you what I mean. So this is actually, I won't read all this to you, but this is a case study of some work that they did in Virginia on a large scale dredge project. And it's, we're hoping to get something similar to this going on here in Ohio. And so there are links, so if anybody did want to look up and get more uh, information about what they did. So the general process is the sediment is mechanically dredged and put into these big scows. Scow is a new word that I learned. Uh, so the scows actually then come into a staging area, which would be in one of the, well, the harbor areas. It's actually the dredge is mixed with water to form a slurry so that it can be hydraulically um, offloaded and well, scooted into land. So the dredge slurry can be pumped three to five miles inland easily, but with pipelines it can go as much as 20 to 25 miles inland. So we can move this material inland where it maybe will be of benefit. So this is a, th uh, yeah, sorry, I, these don't show up very well, but this is this big dark blob here is the hydraulic loading of the dredge slurry into, onto a farm field in Virginia, and these are the earthen berms just to hold, just to contain it as they're pumping the slurry in. And so then it was dewatered, so it took a year, year and a half to dewater and reoxidize. And then in 2002, they were harvesting wheat. And they've been uh, cropping this ever since. As a matter of fact, now, um, 
Um, now they actually are harvesting the soil out of this site. Soil blenders are coming in and they want this material. So they're selling the dewatered, oxidized dredge material to soil blenders for the landscape industry in the Virginia area. So that's kind of cool. So um, what we're hoping is that Toledo Harbor dredge material as a component in manufactured soil blends may provide an alternative to open lake disposal, could be a clean, low-cost, soil-like component uh, for soil blending, and this could have a potential economic benefit for both the producers and consumers of topsoil, and certainly it should have an environmental benefit from reuse rather than mining virgin topsoil for the landscape industry. But finally, we're coming around to the realization that upland placement may have to play a major role just due to issues of scale and in dewatering this massive amount of material. That's a whirlwind soil science tour. So. <laughs> Because we're working with a group, I, actually I think they're affiliated with Mercy Hospital in Toledo, and we're going to be rehabbing a small park, but that's just for a park, but it's like a third of an acre right downtown Toledo, but they do do urban gardening, and so we have, to, you know, offered to them that we'd be happy to work with them more, and I do think a material like this could be good, especially if they've got degraded inner city soils, I mean, you know, I will say that Urban agriculture scares me because I think people are not doing an adequate job of soil testing before they start planting their vegetables, and there have been some mm, not good headlines. So something like this could help with that because if we could provide something clean, well, that would be, I think that would be exciting. Right. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, how did the city of Toledo get into this partnership where you were analyzing this? You know, they determined they needed it. What is the mechanics of that? The mechanics of that is that the Toledo and Cleveland and Detroit and a lot of these cities are struggling right now with these, uh, these well, they have land banks and they're tearing down all these properties. And we, of course, know this is going on. So we actually approached them. And uh, so we went through the Port Authority, Joe Kappel, who was a tremendous advocate of all things dredge at the port. And he, we actually had a meeting at his office with Find the people that are going to be your partners to make it work. And the scientists that can do that effectively have successful careers. And, and, and Dr. Dayton's good at it. You have to be dogged. There's no question about it. If the first, uh, first person says, uh-uh, then keep, keep asking. And then also you learn. You say, well, why don't you think I'm right? What, why, what, do, you, what do you need? And then let them tell you. And then you can adjust your thinking to either to deliver what they need, or you can tell them where they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but you do have to. But you know, people want to tell you what they need, and you need to let them. Anybody else? Okay. Yes. How much more of the of the um, dress material can you use by nearby land application? Are you still going to be having to do something with the other dress material? I think. Well, well, you, to do it hydraulically, you're limited to move it hydraulically. Then, if 
you wanted to pick it up and put it in a truck, you could take it anywhere, but then you're just limited by economics. And so that's, we're actually, um, with Arcadis, we're, we're going to be, under the C grant, we're going to be doing an economic analysis to look at hydraulic versus trucking and all of those costs that are associated with that. But it's a really good question because, for example, I work with one of the major soil blenders in Ohio, Kurtz Brothers. I don't know if you all are. Kurtz Brothers makes 362,000 cubic yards of soil a year for their landscape blend is the rule of thumb. So that's what a big soil blender can make and sell. So that's not a million cubic yards. So we'd have to find lots of those guys or we're going to have to go to the upland disposal route. On the upland disposal route, Libby. I shouldn't say disposal, I say placement. <laughs> upland <laughs> reuse. Re rewind that tape. <laughs> uh, on the upland beneficial reuse strategy. Uh, it's my recollection that what you were talking about, I believe, or what Sam was talking about was like a thousand acres. Am I way off in that number? I think it was between 500 and a thousand acres and it was going to be based on the hydraulic connectivity of the soil. So we're going to be, so that will be my part in it is we're going to go up and do the characterization of whatever, whatever piece of land we find, do the before and the after characterization so we can figure out because the limit there is how much water are you loading? How long is it going to take to dewater? So again, we have to go back, we have to go up and we have to give a reasonable estimate of, so that we can decide how much land do we need. Yeah? Um, if you go back to where you originally did the dredge material and you ran it through like kind of cursory chemical analysis to make sure everything is in line, um, I think we've heard a lot about how there's, there's some pollutants at PCBs, especially in things that are harmful that are found in the dredge material because of the industrial kind of targeted the Toledo Harbor material is because it does not have those problems. Now in the past they were having a lot of those problems and those materials, when I guess the Army Corps before they even go out and dredge they do all the testing because they got to know what's what. And then the contaminated material actually gets sequestered separately in a contaminated CDF. So we're looking for the path of least resistant material because we want to prove the concept before we start arguing over contaminants. For example, Cleveland is struggling right now with um, pH, little bits of pH, little, little benzoepyrene, and it's totally roadblocked them. So I, so we keep saying, well, let's start with, let's start with Toledo. So, but you're right, and that all has to be every batch, every batch, every batch has to be tested because you may find a little hot spot because it's underwater. You don't know. They take it. <laughs> you know, the shipping it wouldn't be the hard part. The hard part is just physically handling it. And so, if we were gonna, it would be very expensive to ship it to Canada. And so, the question, so that's why we're actually doing the economic analysis because Detroit, they're not that far around. Maybe they'd want some. Um, so yes, that's why we're doing the economic analysis so that we can see well, where, who wants it, where can we take it? Because we could set up multiple of the hydraulic moving stations. We don't have to have just one. And so we could start uh, dispersing it. Any, anybody who'll take it. <laughs> yes. um, that dredge material, I go to school um, up on Lake Superior and Huron. And are those the big white like bags on the, like the bank that they pump out? Oh, you can do that, yeah, to, okay. for dewatering. Yeah, they have the big mesh bags. Mm -hmm. And so um, you can do that, but that's just really expensive. But for small dredging operations or for individual uses, yeah, they do use those a lot. Okay, I just didn't know if that was what I was saying, what I thought it was. It probably was dredging. Yeah. Any questions online? Yeah, Matt said no. Last question. Yeah. Oh, another question. Go ahead. Question. Um, I thought I heard in the last couple of days something that there was legislation uh, or some something being developed to not allow the dredge to be put in the lake. And 
Am I hearing this right? I only I think that there's, you know, there's a constant tug of war between the Army Corps of Engineers whose charge, who their mandate is to dredge and find the least cost option for disposal that doesn't cause harm. And then, of course, you've got the more environmental concerns who say, no, no, we've got to find a, a, but as I understand it, Toledo Harbor is going to be green-lighted to, for open lake disposal, and I think the, the argument has been in Cleveland whether or not they're going to be allowed to, and I don't think they it, were. It did involve the Corps of Engineers, whatever. All, well, if it's dredging, it involves the Corps of yeah. Engineers, so yeah. It, 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 that kind of thing is, some point along the line, it's likely to happen. That will create an even greater demand for the kind of work that Dr. Dave is doing. Cause then you, you still have to do something with a million cubic yards. And somehow I have to make it all sound exciting enough that people will care and say, oh my God, I want some dredge in my yard. So <laughs> <laughs> I got to come on the that elevator pitch for those of you that were in on the earlier discussion. All right. All right. I think you had one question. I do. So um, I've learned about it before, and Dr. Uh -oh. Fox really hates me for this, but. <laughs> Um, so, you said you like to put back boundary sand in everything. Now, like, is that something that you can do with the also? Like, can go on and put previews in the sunlight? Well, Dr. Bosta and I. Uh, participated in a very large uh, spent foundry sand beneficial reuse project long ago, many years ago. And we characterized spent foundry sands from all around the, well, the, the rust belt. And we were we characterized them for the contaminants, and then we also did just a little bit of soil blending, but that project was more interested in the contaminants. But I actually published a paper on soil blending. And we, you know, it's, it's a big burden for the foundries to be sending completely beautiful sand to the landfill. Now, there are some foundry sands that are bad, and we identified in how to make those distinctions. And so uh, definitely beneficial reuse of foundry sand is a benefit to the foundry industry. And their sand is, in, is interesting because it's very fine. It has an odd no amount of organic matter in it because they actually add a little bituminous coal dust as an oxidizing agent for the foundry process. And so that gives it a little organic matter, a little water holding capacity. And other than that, it's a very uniform, fine sand, and it tends to be a very black color which is nice because that makes your finished soil blend look pretty because people don't like tan soil, they want dark soil. Oh. Thanks very much. Thank you. We're going to take about a five minute break until 8 o'clock and we can start our uh, questions. Which is the advanced one? Oh. And uh, clearly an incredibly important issue. Uh, welcome to the visitors that came over for the other side. Uh, this is Stone Lab. This is the oldest freshwater biological field station in the country. We started in 1895. Uh, we've been up here on this island since 1925. As you look around the room, you see sort of a history of the people that have spoken up there. Across the top are the eight people that have served as directors. On the back wall are some of our uh, uh, donors endowment, the things that allow us to uh, do the things that we do and support the operation up here. These are awards that we have given out to uh, either through our Sea Grant program or Stone Laboratory. And then over here on the wall is the dedication ceremony uh, when the island was, uh, was purchased and dedicated and really we changed from being the Lake Laboratory to Stone Laboratory, and those are images from 1929. Uh, we have five courses underway right now, so some quick announcements real quick. Uh, Dr. Hogarth and Field Zoe, uh, anything, any announcements for you guys? We have a review tomorrow, or the, tomorrow? Yeah, a review tomorrow, and Dr. Simon, ichthyology. We have a quiz tomorrow on uh, head canals and bones, uh, cranial bones of fish. Okay, very good. Dr. Kane, ecology. Exam on the 4th of July. And then set up a big experiment, and depending on how efficient you guys, efficiently you guys set up, we'll have the afternoon off. Mm -hmm. Dr. Marshall, evolution. Over the 
You guys are doing this netting uh, tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. Alright. <laughs> and Dr. Beatty, uh, limnology or aquatic ecosystem? Aquatic ecosystem? Uh, yeah, we had, a, we had an exam today. I don't want to give people an exam on the day after the 4th of July. But, uh, <laughs> but, 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 I, <laughs> but we had a great week last week. Uh, we got to see some of the extremes in Lake Erie. Uh, we went to Sandusky Bay where we saw the water clarity of the second depth was only uh, a third of a meter. And out in the uh, further offshore, we got to see 11 or 12 meters in second depth. It was quite nice. For the people from the other side, what second depth? Is second depth, depth? depth is a white and black uh, disc that you put down in the water, and the depth is the depth to which you can no longer see it. Uh, so if you could see down 12 meters, uh, the lake at that point was maybe only 15 meters deep. So we almost could see to the bottom of a pretty, pretty deep part of the lake. Yeah, and so that's, you know, over 36 feet. Uh, Matt Thomas, lab manager, any announcements? I think we're good. Okay. Dr. Stanford, education outreach coordinator and snake researcher, any, <laughs> anything we should? All good. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, Dr. Winslow, you already had a couple comments. Yep. Everything's good from good. down in Columbus. Yep. Dr. Chapman, uh, research coordinator. We're all good. Okay. Wow. Yes. Yeah, this is this this will be the last time the three of you ever <laughs> told me you're all good at the same time. Great. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm really pleased to uh, introduce our uh, speaker tonight. Uh, I've known John Kleberg. We were trying to think when the first time I met him was, or first time we met, but for many 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 years. Uh, and uh, he's been involved up here at Stone Laboratory actually for many many years. But John's got an interesting background. He's going to talk to us tonight what, what is really an avocation for him. Uh, he's a tremendous history buff, and he loves Jay Cook, and he, and, he, and he loves the castle. But he's also had an incredible background at Ohio State, and, and John has helped us up here at Stone Laboratory probably more than anybody else down on campus because of all the different duties that he has held at the university. John got his uh, uh, bachelor's at Michigan State, uh, master's at University of Illinois, and did some postgraduate work over at Ohio State. And these were in law enforcement things and sociology and business-related things. Uh, and, and John went into the uh, military, uh, served in military police for many years, was the assistant director of the, or assistant chief of police is maybe the appropriate title for uh, uh, down at Ohio State, uh, with the uh, associate director for uh, public safety uh, at Ohio State. He was the, the head of internal audit at Ohio State, which we were kidding earlier, if, if you're the head of internal audit at Ohio State, you know bad things about everybody on campus. <laughs> And that, that makes everybody on campus do anything that you want. If this person asks you, you will definitely do it for them. Uh, John was incredibly helpful for us at uh, getting things done for us up here throughout the years. Uh, and he uh, retired from the university a number of years ago uh, as the assistant vice president, uh, uh, really for business and finance. And that, at, at Ohio State, and recognize Ohio State's the largest university in the country, and the person that runs business and finance, this, this is the person that runs the mechanics of the university that makes the thing operate. Uh, and so John knew, knew everybody, knows everybody, uh, and knew how to get things done. And that was incredibly valuable for us, because when you think of a laboratory like Stone Laboratory, we're a long way from main campus anyway. But we're often like a, you know, a square peg trying to fit into a round hole on a lot of things. And, it, and, and John was really helpful in uh, uh, making things run smoothly for us. Uh, also, the restoration of the lighthouse that uh, uh, many of you have had the opportunity to go into the lighthouse. The lighthouse is open each uh, Monday and Tuesday each week, and you're welcome to go in and, and uh, uh, go to the top of the tower uh, uh, if, if you want to. Uh, 42 steps if you're wondering how you get there, uh, and uh, relatively small hole to crawl through to uh, get out onto the top. Uh, but he's helped 
us in a lot of different ways. And he also uh, was a special assistant for student life over here and did a lot of work on restoration of some of our other buildings. Uh, but today we want him to speak to us about this avocation that he's got. We've had him up here in the past, uh, and we thought that, that this was just an incredibly perfect day for this lecture. Because the, this year, the, the castle is 150 years old. And we're doing a talk on the 4th of July uh, at the time that we're in the process of celebrating the same anniversary of the Civil War. And John's going to tell us a little bit about Cook's relationship to all that. And these things tie incredibly well together. And to do this the day before the 4th of July is just it's, it's perfect timing. So join me in welcoming uh, John Cleaver. We're going to move uh, fairly quickly uh, because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Jeff said I only have two and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to move through this. But as we go along, if there's something that's of particular interest to you, you want clarity on, Raise the question then, I think, rather than wait till the end, uh, because it might help us, you know, explain it. If I know the answer, I'll certainly give it to you. If not, I'll tell you uh, something. Uh, <laughs> but, but acknowledge that I, that may not be the correct answer. Jay Cook is a, is a particularly interesting fellow. Um, this is the beginning paragraph in, a bi in an autobiography that was not published that he was writing. And he explains that, in effect, <clears throat> he has a, a mission to finance the Union in the course of the Civil War. And he feels that way for lots of reasons, uh, some of which are anti-slavery, religious, some of which are his financial acumen, the things that he can accomplish in terms of raising money for the Union. And a, a third probably is his just personal confidence. And this sounds a little egotistical, but he's not an egotistical man at all. This picture is taken at the castle, as you might know, and that's the family in later years. He was descended from Henry Cook, who was first mentioned in 1638 at Salem, Massachusetts. On December 12th of 1812, his father, um, Eleutherus Cook, who becomes significant in terms of both national and Ohio politics later, uh, marries Martha Carswell, who is from the East. He is the son of a Revolutionary War veteran, the father, Eleutherus. They travel from upstate New York with his wife down the Allegheny River through what is now Pittsburgh, and they settle in Madison, Indiana. They build a house in Madison, Indiana, which is on the Ohio River, uh, and he is interested in business, a business enterprise at Madison. He travels back to New York, and in the course of that travel back, comes through Ohio to Sandusky, recognizes the value and the attractiveness of the lake. He becomes an avid fisherman, although he's interested in that at that time, too. And he thinks that this might really be a nice place to settle. So he's born, the, the son now, Jay, the one we're interested in, is born to Eleutherus and his wife on August 10th, 1921, in Sandusky, which at that time was called Ogans Place. Ogans was, uh, for those of you who are local, probably know that he was the, the leader in the Indians that were in that part of Ohio at the time. The family becomes very well acquainted with him. In fact, he he spends time in their home. Uh, he visits with them regularly. And the mansion that Cook builds in Philadelphia, where he later lives, is called Ogans. He's primarily self-taught. He has some formal education at what we would consider today at an elementary level, not even at a secondary level. But he's particularly adept at mathematics and, and things related to finances. He prospers because of the political connections that his family has. 
His father is elected to the legislature, Eleutherus, and subsequently is elected to Congress for one term. He gets the first license from the state to run a railroad in Ohio. Now, you might say, why Jay if his father is Eleutherus? And you'll see that Jay's brother is Pitt. And Eleutherus comments in his political enterprises that his biggest problem is the spelling on his name. Because when they had ballots at that time, in the early 1800s, you wrote in the name of the candidate, you didn't check a box. And if your name was misspelled, as close as it might be, now you didn't get the vote. So, <laughs> Eleutherus's wife, Jay's mo mother, says, that's the end of this. You know, they're going to be Jay, and they're going to be Pitt, and they're going to be Henry, and uh, there are no more Eleutheruses. <laughs> they build a stone house in downtown Sandusky, right here. Uh, that structure, which, which exists today, was built in 43 and 44, and he died, the Lutherist, the father of Jay now, dies in that house at, during the Civil War in 1864. It's since been moved, uh, for those of you in the Sandusky area or who have visited down there, uh, it's, um, I can't think of the street name right now, but it's moved to that current site in 1878. It's currently managed by the Ohio History Connection, which was the former Ohio Historical Society. Uh, unfortunately, it's architecture, on the, well, the outside architecture is essentially the same. Inside uh, modernization of it uh, doesn't represent in any way the way it looked at the Cooks, the time that the Cooks were there. He was first, em Cook now, Jay, is first employed um, after formal school on a Sandusky dry goods store at a very early age. He moves to St. Louis when he's age 15, works in a dry goods store. He works in uh, Phil at, uh, Philadelphia at age 17 on a packet boat company. And then at age 18, he becomes employed by E.W. Clark Banking. And that's the, the business that becomes uh, the Jay Cook uh, enterprise in banking. At age 21, he's marketing bonds for the Mexican War through the E.W. Clark Banking Company. The Jay Cook Company, and that's the one that's involved in financing the Civil War now for the Union, uh, begin, banking, and began in Philadelphia in 1861, New York in 1866, London had offices in 1873. It failed in 1873 during the Depression, the uh, collapse of the economy. Uh, it was a national issue with regard to the fiscal condition of the country. And it was reorganized by Charles D. Barney, which is his son-in-law, in 1880. So, He's most known for his financial success in funding the war efforts during the Civil War. Uh, he founded that Cook, the J. Cook Company, as I mentioned, in Philadelphia, and arranged for uh, $3 million in money for Pennsylvania to participate in the Civil War. And initially, when the war began, the states were responsible to provide the troops and to support the troops. Philadelphia did that initially uh, as one of the original uh, participants in bringing troops into the Union Army, and Cook financed them uh, to the tune of $3 million. Cook's brother, Pitt, um, is uh, really acquainted with Salmon Chase in a personal way. Salmon Chase, uh, we'll talk about him and, and his uh, uncle for just a second, uh, is an Ohio resident, out of Columbus. He has served in the government in Columbus. He was governor of the state. Um, Cook's brother runs the Columbus newspaper as a publisher. So that relationship between Salmon Chase and politics and Cook's brother, in this case not Pitt but Henry, uh, become uh, very well acquainted and becomes very important in terms of how Cook becomes involved in financing the war. <clears throat> Chase is born in New Hampshire. He's raised by an uncle.
student of Cincinnati College and later at Dartmouth. He's the governor of Ohio, senator from Ohio, becomes secretary of the treasury under Lincoln. For those of you who have read uh, a Team of Rivals, uh, that history about the cabinet that Lincoln struggled with, uh, Chase was a real character in there and, uh, and an important player. And then Lincoln appoints him Chief Justice of the United States in 1864. He really appoints him Chief Justice because that's what Chase wants more than anything. And it gives Lincoln a chance to get him out of the cabinet, which he was really trying to do. Uh, he visits Cook at Gibraltar, after Cook has the place here, and they continue that personal relationship. What, what's significant about it is that he is raised by Philander Chase, who is actually his uncle. And he raises him after the death of Chase's father. Philander starts Kenyon College in Worthington and then moves it to Overland. I mean, to uh, up at uh, Gambier. Gambier. <laughs> lost it. Up at Gambier. So it, it's, uh, it begun, begins as a uh, religious college with a religious foundation. He later moves on then to um, Illinois. But he is responsible in large measure for Salmon, probably for Salmon Chase's opinions on slavery and uh, being active in anti-slavery movements. That influences Cook, we think, too, because of that close relationship. So Cook is appointed the bond agent for the Union and devises methods to sell bonds at citizens, to the ordinary citizens in amounts as low as $50. Over 3 million individual investors bought bonds. At the time, a very unusual investment on the part of the individual. In 60, by 1864, Cook had raised money at the rate of $2 million a day by selling bonds to individuals. Sherman from Lancaster, William T. Sherman's uh, brother from Lancaster, is in the Senate in Congress. And his relationship with the President and with Chase becomes significant in Cook actually becoming the grand financier, financier, if you want, for the Union during the war. So you've got Chase, Sherman, two Cooks, and it's that community of uh, individuals working collectively that really becomes significant in, in raising funds. Uh, one of the things that's particularly unique about it is that, that he comes up with various means to sell bonds to individuals. Uh, he used the bank as a depository for cash, which provided income from sales beyond the small percentage which was authorized by the Treasury. So before the Civil War, only about 1% of the individual citizens owned securities. Daily life was a cash operation. Following the war, nearly 5% owned and that, in effect, was the result primarily of Cook's efforts and in financing the war. The first bond sales by uh, the government, as I indicated, uh, were small amounts. And after Bull Run, when $50 million was raised uh, with some difficulty, but it was the first huge, large bond sale uh, to support the Army. A letter from Henry, is, this is his brother Henry now, who was in Columbus, now is in Washington. Um, it, it, uh, on December 18, 1860, right before the Civil War uh, is beginning, uh, he writes that the Union prospects are slim. All our friends here think the cotton states do not desire a settlement of existing uh, troubles on any terms except secession and that it will be impossible for the North to make any proposal that will be acceptable. So this is communication between Henry in Washington, brother Jay in Philadelphia, who's raising money already to support uh, the Pennsylvania troops. In 1861, 
1961, Cook actually offers to Chase that he will undertake the challenge of raising funds for the Union. He instructs Henry to uh, contact the Secretary. They're closer than Jay is with, with Chase at this point, Henry and, and Salmon Chase, and tell him that I hold myself at his service, pay or no pay, I will do all I can to aid him in Treasury matters. He, in effect, is offering his talent and his skill at raising money, which he knows the Union needs to support uh, the Army. Innovative ways uh, to sell securities to individuals were really the product of his imagination. He knew that you couldn't go to uh, financial institutions and raise enough money to support the troops, that you had to sell these bonds in relatively small amounts to individuals. And so the, the initiative, the effort on his part was to suggest to people, if you can't serve in the military, you need to buy bonds to support the military. It was a patriotic type of a pitch, uh, which uh, really became the, the uh, nationwide initiative to raise those kinds of money. The, initially, it was a 6% loan, which wasn't a bad return in those days, so at $50 per bond at a 6% return, uh, there was it was attractive to individuals to come up with that kind of dollars as an investment. He marketed securities to individuals. He promoted a patriotic responsibility. He used the wire services. First time that that was done in banking to actually sell securities across the country. He had about 2,500 agents in small banks, real estate firms, insurance salesmen, uh, across the country who were marketing these bonds to raise this kind of money. So he, he in effect, is the first investment banker. Uh, this was a notice on the first bond sales for Pennsylvania when I mentioned he was after that three million. Uh, this is a copy of the correspondence from Chase here appointing him the bond agent, which was that, that uh, Jay Cook and company was the person company responsible for the sale of bonds to raise funds for the union. And again, you know, the, the, the issue of a patriotic appeal was very, very important. And he, he thought, and he turned out to be correct, that this was a very effective way of um, getting the individual citizen across the country who wasn't involved in military service to buy bonds to support the the uh, Army and the Union. This particular letter is in his own hand and it was published but uh, was not attributed to him. So he, he, he personalized things uh, without taking credit for him, if you will. The 520s were a particularly attractive bond to the ordinary person. It's a 6% bond, bond with a 20 year maturity but a five year demand. So at five years, you could force you know, repayment if you needed it. But if you went to 20, of course, at 6%, you're going to be making more money. So that, again, was a way in which he could uh, fluctuate, if you will, the way these things were marketed uh, to the ordinary person. Uh, uh, you know, getting to that individual person, for example, here's a, a notice uh, that was posted in, in a newspaper, published in a newspaper in the German language. Again, he was personalizing it. He was making it attractive. And the question was, is this him? Or are, are these marketers, you know, that he has working for him? There's every indication in the, in the material literature that's available that it's him. You know, this, this is his thinking. This is the way that he thought it would work. The financial long-term implications of this is that uh, for some of us may remember in first and second, well not first, but second World War, uh, war bonds. You know, it started with Jay Cook and the Civil War. Those were war bonds, and we continued to, to uh, sell war bonds. And in many cases during the Second World War, they were $25 bonds at 6% or less. The age 
agents worked unusual business hours. You know, it wasn't banking hours. They, they made themselves available. They were in the community. They tried to get people interested in it on a personal basis. They used telegraph and wire services, as I mentioned. Everybody banked at Jay Cook. What's particularly interesting about this check from John Wilkes Booth is the date. Uh, he's withdrawing $100 from his account, and it's just weeks before the assassination. So Cook has a bank in D.C., and as we indicated in the other cities, you know, Philadelphia is really where it was headquartered, but in D.C. too. But everybody banked with Jerry Cook. Uh, this is an uh, indication of some of the material where he's reporting on the loan and the, the uh, success of it politically and personally to uh, uh, Chase and the people in the Treasury. So during the 1850s, the national government budget was about 50 to 60 million. In 1860, before the war started, it was 74 million with a $10 million debt and an overall debt level of 90 million. By the uh, with the war spending at one point uh, was at 1.3 billion in 65 with a debt over 2.7 billion with daily war expenditures at 1.2. So there was a, a need for cash, a constant need for cash. And you can see that the debt level is going up significantly. He also made arrangements to get funds from uh, other countries uh, beyond the success that they were having of selling individual bonds in this country. They borrowed money in England. They borrowed money in Germany, and they borrowed money in Holland, the, the Netherlands. And this was done through the banking company, through the J. Cook Banking Company, and it's negotiations with those banking companies in those countries to get the funds back here. All of those uh, paid at, uh, you know, they were bought at par with like a 6% and they were paid. So, you know, the question becomes, uh, and he's, there's a, a period there where and, and written, uh, there's uh, published material about the robber barbers and the people who, who took advantage of the country at the end of the Civil War, through the Civil War, and into the beginning of the, of the next century. And he is often listed as one of those robber barons, one of those who personally made an enormous amount of money uh, on the war. And uh, the fact of the matter is that's not true. He offered to support the Treasury in raising funds using new methods, which found out worked, with or without a commission. He recognized the income potential by using the bank as a depository, but the commission on Treasury bonds was three-tenths of one percent. So subscriptions to the bonds was $148 million, subscribed for resale, 92 and direct investment, 58 What's significant is his net profit at the end was less than a million dollars. So clearly not a robber baron, and that was at uh, three-tenths of one percent, uh, which is the cost of the sale. Uh, he was a very religious person. Uh, he personally, here at uh, Gibraltar and South Bass, in addition to uh, his home in Philadelphia, just outside Philadelphia, uh, exercised uh, his faith in lots of ways. Um, he, this is a letter to uh, Secretary Chase where he kind of, uh, in, in this paragraph, can't really read it, but suggests that uh, what's really missing is the religious perspective of fighting the war and what that means. He served on the, the uh, board of the Christian Commission during the war and he was instrumental in supporting war veterans and window, uh, widows with uh, his personal finances. Money he gave away. He's, you know, he's known to have visited with uh, President Lincoln during the war on at least one occasion with the troops uh, near Washington where, where Lincoln, Bates, Chase, and uh, Cook would travel out on at least one occasion. It's actually some indication there were four, but on at least one we have good documentation where he went out to review troops with them. Uh, this is a very famous photo of, of uh, Lincoln uh, outside of Washington with Alan Pinkerton at his 
website, you know, it's, it's conceivable that uh, he would have done it that site. This is Pinkerton here. But um, nothing for sure. He writes in that autobiography, which was not published, about an encounter he has with uh, Lincoln while they're riding out to review the troops. And what he, what he is saying is uh, a reflection on both his personality and the president's personality. And you can't really see it because of the, this image, but this is um, the secretary here, Bates, and he has a white beard. He always had a white hair, and, and any photos we have on, and very dark hair. And Cook is asking the president about, you know, that, that's like my father. He had a white beard, but he had dark hair. Why is that? And President Lincoln says, well, that's because Bates uses his mouth more than he uses his brains. <laughs> so he has left, but his brain, but his uh, jaw is white. <laughs> Uh, this is a telegram from Henry, who's in Washington now, to Jay, who is in Philadelphia, about the assassination of the president. And uh, he actually says in here that uh, there's been a capture in this, actual, most of it I think is in the actual second page of it, notes that the, uh, they were caught, that the assassins were caught, uh, which at this point we know was not true. There was a lot of misinformation. Henry wrote Jay almost daily uh, with regard to issues associated with assassination in the news. Um, a telegram tells of Lincoln's death. Henry was previously, as I mentioned to you, the owner of the Columbus newspaper. So he's interested, Henry's interested in this probably for Jay's sake and the financial end of things, but also from his personal sake in the political realm. He reports on a letter April 15th, reports on the assassination of the president and other events. He signed, and is signed by Henry, you know, a night of horror. Jay's son, uh, Henry, travels to, so you've got the brother Henry and the son Henry. The son Henry is an Episcopal priest, becomes an Episcopal he is also an avid photographer. So Grant is visited by the son, Henry, and Grant's comment, recorded comment to Henry is that when, when you go back and tell, you know, visit with your father, you tell him <clears throat> that he and his efforts at raising funds for the union is absolutely significant it's more than all the generals in the army have done, and without his aid, we could do no, we could not have done any fighting. This was in uh, 1865 at City Point, which is at the very end of the war. So there's a recognition, uh, and he becomes Cook, J. Cook, becomes very personally uh, acquainted with Grant when Grant in uh, the uh, presidency becomes president. Now, let's just bring him home. Let's bring him to uh, Lake Erie and to Sandusky and to this area. He's born from Sandusky, he goes east, he stays east. His father uh, he lives in Sandusky, he dies in, in uh, uh, many of the members of the family should say really die in Sandusky and, and are buried there. Middle, North, and South Bass Islands are originally a part of the Connecticut Western Reserve. And they are owned by Judge Ogden Edwards. About 1854, A.P. Edwards acquires the property. And in 1898, Teresa Thorndale, who has uh, published quite a bit, she both in terms of local media and some publications books, reports that Gibraltar was actually occupied in 1845 uh, by the Army. And that's true, they were. The, the uh, Lake Erie Islands and Lake Erie to the west were all surveyed by the U.S. Army topographical engineers to map the lake, to map the shoreline. When they were here, they camped, stayed on Gibraltar Island. Uh, we 
know that not because she said so, but because in the National Archives is a record of the U.S. Army Topographical Engineers with a notation uh, that says that they are on Gibraltar Island. A couple other interesting things on the island before Cook gets here. On July 15, 1863, uh, article in the Sandusky Register says that James Ross and John Elliott have graves marked on Gibraltar Island. And on those markings, Ross is, is it's indicated that James Ross died on August 11th, and John Elliott died on September uh, 18th, and that he was aged 47 the same year. Uh, there is a cholera uh, epidemic going on in Sandusky about that time. Uh, they are not mentioned. Who they are, or where they were buried, or why they were buried, uh, we simply don't have any idea. Except that you will find on the extreme east end of the island a marker for uh, James Ross. With that death date, with the idea that he is James Ross from one of Perry's ships during the Battle of Lake Erie. It's not so. That Ross is buried in Pennsylvania and it's very well documented. So who these two guys were, uh, we really don't have any idea. There is an indication, though, in written reports, uh, people reflecting back very often that part of, of uh, Gibraltar, the lookout point, was used for Perry uh, during, by his troops as a lookout during the uh, Battle of Lake Erie to see the British coming out of Canada. There's a disagreement about that. There are some that would believe that uh, the lookouts were actually on masts on ships in the bay, uh, but if you climb a mast on a ship in the bay and look toward Canada, or you go out on Gibraltar Island at Lookout Point and look that way up the lake or the west, I think most would conclude that uh, they probably did indeed use the lookout at uh, Gibraltar. Following that war, there was a, a plan for a monument, the first ferry monument, and it was uh, the product of the uh, initiative by Usher Parsons, who was a, a surgeon on Perry ships during the Battle of Lake Erie. Uh, Dr. R. Robert, which means, is the husband of the woman who takes care of the castle when Cook has it. He is a personal friend, professional friend, really, with Parsons because of the uh, their medical practices and experiences. So he, Parsons is writing to McMean, says he's going to be out this way. We really ought to get a monument to Perry in the Battle of Lake Erie. Uh, we can probably do that for five or ten bucks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so in 1852, there's a military encampment of militia at South Pass, and there they form a Perry Monument Association, but little happens. A few years later, seven years later, the association gets new life and moves forward, and the cornerstone is laid on Gibraltar, and the island owner, De Rivera, Jose De Rivera, gives the land for that monument to the association. That deed restriction for that monument still exists. It was transferred in the sale of the property from De Rivera to Cook. So Cook, in 1864-5, is the owner of the island, and the, and, the cor cor and the current monument is constructed. The cornerstone has never been opened. The, the monument, which is east of the castle, which Cook installed in 1865. He buys the island in 1864. 
A year later, he, he creates that monument in 1865 by a, a uh, person out of Sandusky who was the uh, mason for it. And they put it on that cornerstone. Uh, I would speculate that maybe one of the reasons was that nothing bigger would ever be built there because of that heat restriction, because now there exists a monument. We do know the contents of the box in the cornerstone, under the cornerstone. There's a, there's a cement platform on which the monument sits, and the box is buried in that um, base. Know the contents of that, is, that has never been opened. So, Cook acquires Gibraltar, personal journey entry from De Rivera to Cook, uh, noting the transaction to Cook in 1864. Uh, the, the, that written record, that written journal actually still exists. Uh, he bought the island for $3,001. Remember that Cook's a finance guy. Uh, the story goes that he asked. I'm really interested in that island. I'd like to put a place there for the summer. How much is it going to cost? And De Rivera says, I cannot take less than $3,000. Cook says, I'll give you $3,001. And the deal's made. <laughs> he, buy, he buys it in 64 for 3001 The construction of the summer home begins immediately under the direction of his brother, Pitt, who is now living in uh, Sandusky with his father. His father, Jay's father, is still alive. Eleutherus is still alive there. And Eleutherus writes to Jay, who now is in Philadelphia, uh, about the construction of the castle. And is saying, you know, it's going to be a glorious resort and a truly appropriate retreat for you, for the dust, and cares, and business and constructed from imperishable materials that will stand for ages, May 20th, 1864. The blue limestone that that castle was built from comes from Sandusky. It was all brought, up, brought out from Sandusky. The mason uh, contractor who built the castle was from Sandusky. The lime used to uh, uh, fix the blocks uh, of uh, masonry, the, Marble is was all done here on South Bass Island at the old film. Uh, this is that uh, a letter or a report from his father to uh, Jay on the progress. This is the only known drawing of what the house was intended to look like. We think, but are not certain that there are no architectural drawings, that it was simply built up. Um, that, that the, uh, as things progressed, you know, Jay might make an adjustment here, an adjustment there, or Pitt might make an adjustment here, an adjustment there, or maybe his father. But we don't think uh, that there was ever an architect involved or that there was any architectural drawings for construction, that it really was that letter. Oh, this is the monument. Now it's, an, it's a year later, 64, it gets the island. Uh, they start construction of the house. 65, the uh, monument goes up. It's what sits out there today. The platform below it is where the original cornerstone was put in in 1858. And the, the uh, contractor actually built it was a Thomas Lawrence also in Sandusky. There's an old picture uh, from the 1880s with uh, the monument and the castle. There's the monument there. So Cook uh, married uh, Dorothea Elizabeth Allen. They lived in Philadelphia most of the time. Uh, the time at Gibraltar was uh, generally spent with family and friends. He was an avid fisherman. It was truly a vacation land, uh, area for him. A vacation spot to get away from the city, and they entertained many, many notables there. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes was a regular, um, Salmon Chase was a regular, uh, people locally you know, would, would visit. One of the things, uh, because of his religious uh, perspective, again, that I mentioned previously, he would entertain 
clergy from various denominations, and he would have them uh, come at his expense to the island by themselves for two weeks. They could not bring the family, they could not uh, you know, bring friends or anything. They came by themselves. They would come to the island, and uh, he had Presbyterians and Episcopalians and Lutherans and Methodists, and it was the most ecumenical thing that uh, one could imagine for that, that time. All at his expense, there's excellent correspondence and records uh, from those clergy after they left. Uh, again, you know, a, a reflection, I guess you might say, of, of his faith. Uh, William T. Sherman and Colonel, uh, yeah, it was, uh, General Ward, I guess at the time, Ford, Ford Orange, California, uh, are on the lake on a revenue cutter. And uh, it's reported to Cook at the castle that they're going to stop. They're coming into South Bass Island. He'd like to see Gibraltar. He'd like to see Cook and, you know, tell him what a good job he did and uh, financing him that. And uh, Cook says, it's Sunday. We don't entertain people. I don't care who he is, you know, he's not going to come here. And he sends one of the kids up and they yank the flag down from the top of the castle tower. And, you know, he's not welcome. Uh, they come anyway because he, Cook is convinced by his his family and, and others that he really should accept William T. Sherman as a host, as a guest and be a host because Sherman was so significant during the war. After he leaves, and he has a uh, diary that he keeps a record of all the people who have visited, those are available. The university has some and, and uh, Hayes Center has some. Uh, there's two and a half pages about uh, how he wished that they had been more respectful of his faith and why it isn't on Sunday. He just goes on and on and on about, uh, you know, that the leaders of our country don't have the faith that they should have, and it's just a, it's a remarkable uh, commentary. That's the, in the tower on the first floor, <coughs> that's the um, library. All, all of the woodwork here is still in place. Um, uh, it's all handmade, I would presume, uh, no, none of it's manufactured at all. It's very, very well done, very nice. An early drawing on the, on the north side, porch, tower. And this is an early picture from across the bay. Early life on Gibraltar, you can see here, this is the original caretaker's cottage. There's a caretaker's cottage, and then the castle was up at the end, uh, and that's all that was there. That is not the caretaker's cottage that is there now. That one was taken down and then it went built. Uh, he was also a soft touch, much because of his uh, religion and his faith. The most interesting correspondence is from a Confederate prisoner in Elmira, New York, who uh, in effect says, Mr. Cook, it's freezing up here. You know, I'm not used to this kind of weather. Could you please send me some warm clothes or some money? Now, we don't know if he sent it or not, but uh, it, it's possible he did. But he supports schools and, and material for churches and, and study schools and so on. He entertained uh, clergy, as I indicated. He was primary. He was one of the primary people responsible for the construction of St. Paul Episcopal Church here on the island. Um, funded a cha challenge the members of the uh, parish to contribute, to this, but he funded a good portion of it. Uh, that's a very early picture of the church, their original parsonage, which is not there any longer. Pictures from the island. <coughs> uh, this is Henry, the Episcopal priest, who is the photographer. Most of these are the product of his photography. Uh, this is Cook in older age, and that's Mrs. McMeans, Mrs. Robert McMeans, who was the caretaker of the house. Um, her husband is the surgeon, Robert McMeans, who dies during the Civil War. He really liked the place. He uh, wrote in the book, this uh, director I was telling you about, of, of guests and commentary and, and impressions and weather reports and fishing experience and all kinds of things. Uh, how happy he was uh, with 
the island and uh, how much it meant to him. In 1873, Cook goes bankrupt, a uh, major, major financial collapse in the country. Grant's president. Cook is actually having dinner with Grant when Grant gets the notice uh, on the problems with the banking. Uh, the island goes into a um, trust to be sold. It goes up for auction. It's not sold. Nobody buys it. And in 1880, Cook buys it all back for uh, $20,000. So between 73 and 80, uh, it's closed. Uh, this is a trustee sale notice. Um, he was also very instrumental in, in the expansion and the uh, investing in the Northern Pacific Railroad. Again, he lost all personal uh, money in 1873 when that crash occurred. Supposedly, and I think the record is clear, that everyone who had, uh, we didn't have FDIC and stuff, obviously, but everyone who lost money in his bank was made whole by Cook personally after he came out of uh, bankruptcy. That's what it looked like in 1880 from across the bay. This portrait uh, of Cook is by William Merritt Chase, who was a very notable impressionist and portrait artist. It hangs in the Treasury Department. It was given by J. Horace Harding, who was a uh, son-in-law. Yeah, son-in-law. Um, it stands, or it's, it's currently on the wall outside of Salmon Chase's restored office in the Treasury. There's an exact copy of it. It's not a copy, actually, another exact oil which hangs in the boardroom of Chase in New York. So OSU gets the island in 1925. The descendants, actually through the daughter, sell the property to Julia Stone, who's a university trustee. He immediately gives it to the university for purposes of establishing a lake laboratory. And uh, over the years, obviously, besides the castle itself, other buildings uh, have been constructed. When the university got it in, in 1925, there were three buildings for sure. Uh, the, the cottage that Laura Harding <coughs> used, the castle, and the caretaker's house. It was designated as Save America's Treasure in 1966. Placed on the, the historic register for landmarks, national historic landmark, which is more significant than a uh, National Historic Place. So it's a very significant property uh, in terms of the history of the country and certainly of this area. Any questions? Thank you.
died, baby died on South Pass. Family brought her over and buried her. Don't know where. Don't know why. Then the, those two burials, Ross and, and Elliot, they are described as having been buried on the west end of the island. When the construction of the lab started in the 20s, there's, a, there's a, an account, and we're struggling to find any documentation on it, which says that they dug up bones. And there's a characterization that those bones were the bones of a giant. Uh, they're very tall. I don't think they're much more than that tall. And that they were reburied. That's all I know. Has their family ever come back, like, the defendants anything, ask questions? No, you know, we... And, and uh, with a lot of effort, believe me, for Elliot and Ross, we can't even find a record of their existence. No birth records, no census records, no death records. What about the Cook family in general, though? Are they active on the uh, which, which family? Just the Cook family. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, do we know if the exterior of the castle was meant to be half stone and half, I guess, siding or whatever it is now? Well, when we first started looking at the, at the restoration of it, um, there's two levels in the back. One is the servants' quarters, and that was built that way. Then there was a shed, which was actually held the fishing boats and stuff until a fishing uh, boat dock, whatever, was built down with the water. Um, so, and then there were fishing poles and all that kind of stuff. We thought that was added. Uh, but it turns out in some very early photos that that was probably part of the original construction or very shortly afterward. So it, it was intended that way. The, um, the, the castle itself, if you go out and you look up on the eaves, you have crenellations and have very unusual eave supports. Uh, those couldn't be made until about that time. Uh, and they were made out east because the carpenters didn't have the kinds of coping saws and stuff that they could cut those kinds of curves. So that's a very eastern and very original uh, piece of architecture on the eave supports here. But the, but the stone itself, it was all quarried here, it was all brought across. So, and the guy built it in really two years, a little, little less than two years. I also said that anything was new with the history here, but um, does that little where that where the uh, um, grave or the gravestone used to be, there's a little hole in the side that looks like an old form. No one knows that. You went toward the east end there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to go in there one time yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> because I, I would think there might be a possibility. We tried to get the land, the, the ground radar guys from the College of Engineering up here, but they didn't. And um, it, it's possible, you know, there's something, but it's also possible it's part of the dreams and stuff. In the early, um, late 1800s, on the north side of the castle, between the castle and the water, was a um, oil-driven electric generating system. And that ran electricity to the castle. So in the late 1800s, the castle got electricity, but they generated it themselves from this state. There's no remnant of that left down there at all. Thanks very much, John. Or one more thing? One more thing. Yeah, that some of you might, if you're local, might remember that on the top of this tower, there used to be a observatory. That was added in, I think, what, the 40s or something like that? I was going to say 30. It could have been 40. Yeah, and then it was you know, subsequently taken off. And the students were in there until late 82, I think. 80, 85 was 85 the last was year. Last one. And then uh, it just simply became unsafe. When I was the this. Green map all day, the, the green map all day don't. Yeah. On the, on the well, the, the, if the early pictures when, when the family was there, uh, in the middle of that tower at the top was a huge flagpole. Almost, the, the flag was almost like a garrison flag. When, when they were here, flag was up. And when Sherman was coming, we're <laughs> 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 out of here. Yeah.
Thanks very much, John. Thank you very much, Dr. Dayton. Thank you very much. Excellent job tonight. See you next week.